My good friends, it's my honor to present to you the next president of the United States, Senator Hillary Clinton. Thank you, thank you, Jerry. Thank you all so much. Wow, it is so great to be here with all of you. And I gotta tell you, don't you just uh, love how understated Jerry is? <laughs> he was a great chairman for the Kentucky Democratic Party because he took that same enthusiasm and he went to work every day. And I'm so pleased to be here with your governor and with Jane and I'm so proud that he comes from right here in this county and he's taken all those good values and he's putting them to work on behalf of the state of Kentucky. You know, I'm pleased that I have a chance to come and be part of this party dinner because I know how important it is that we stay organized and unified. You know, we may go through primary elections like we are today, but when they're over, Democrats get together and we work hard and we elect Democrats to offices from the county to the state to the White House. Let me ask you, are you ready to take that White House back? Are you ready to turn our country around? Yeah. Well, so am I. And as you know, this state has voted for a Clinton before, twice in fact. And I think together we're once again going to turn the bluegrass state blue. Will you help us do that? I'm delighted to be here with Representative Eddie Ballard, with Mayor Will Cox, with Sharon Glover, the party chair, with Tim Thomas, the county party chair, and with Jennifer Moore, the state chair. So we've got everybody all geared up and ready to go to work. And I'm thrilled that on my first trip here to Kentucky, I could be with all of you because I know that when we're looking at winning Kentucky in the fall, we got to win from one end of Kentucky to the other, and we're going to end up in this time zone bringing it home. You know, when you look at this great crowd, and I had a fabulous rally earlier in Louisville, People are turning out because we know we are on the cusp of a historic election. Right. We understand that if we do what we must do to put together the kind of agenda for change linked to practical results, restore the confidence of people in democratic leadership, remind our Republican friends they no longer have a claim to fiscal responsibility because it was a Democratic president that balanced the budget and put us on the right track. <laughs> then I know that that feeling that has taken over our country, I sense it from one coast to the next. It's like you could just sense the movement. We're all going forward together. We wish the election were tomorrow. We want to see that moving van leave the White House and send President Bush back to Texas. The whole world will breathe a sigh of relief when George Bush and Dick Cheney are finally gone. That is not when the work ends, that's when our work begins. Because yes, we're going to inherit a lot of damage. It's unfortunate the governor and Jane and I were just talking about all of the problems that 
are going to be left to the next president. And when we finally swear in that president on January 20th, 2009, it's not only going to take a new president, it's going to take every one of us resolve to do all we can to make it clear that our country is back, that we're heading in a new direction, and that we are entering the future with confidence and optimism that we can solve our problems and make it clear that we're moving together into the future. Because in the past seven years, George Bush has done more damage to our country and our Constitution than we had imagined could be done. He took that balanced budget and surplus he inherited, and he basically just threw it away. We're now deeply in debt. We owe money to everybody. You all know we owe money to China. Well, we owe money to Mexico. There's hardly a country we don't owe money to. He has mortgaged our future, and I'm afraid it's one of those subprime mortgages. We borrow money from the Chinese to buy oil from the Saudis. We are not in control of our fiscal destiny. And President Bush has basically looked at the young people here and said, you're on your own. Every child born in America is born with $30,000 of debt on his or her tiny shoulders. And of course, we know where the money went, don't we? It went for tax cuts for the wealthiest of Americans and the war in Iraq. And now, we have to end this dangerous experiment in extremism. We have to put hard-working families first, not corporate special interests the way George Bush has. You know, if you're wealthy or well-connected or privileged, he's been a great president for you. Because no-bid contracts, cronyism, giveaways to the oil companies and the insurance companies and the drug companies and Wall Street, by my reckoning, $55 billion a year goes to those kind of special interests. They've had their president. Now it's time we had a president again who would stand up and fight for all of you, for your jobs, your families, your futures. You know, President Bush has used fear to divide us and fatalism to discourage us. It's as though he wants us to believe that we can't solve our problems. Become energy independent? Oh, we can't do that. Provide health care for every American? Well, we can't do that. Get out of Iraq? Oh, we can't do that. We shouldn't even try. He has created a situation in which Americans who are always about solving problems have been stymied. Well, that's going to change. Because like so much else about his presidency, it's just wrong. We Democrats believe we still are the can-do nation. We believe there isn't anything we can't do together. There is no frontier we can't cross. There is no barrier we cannot overcome on a way to a better, more prosperous, more peaceful future. We believe that tomorrow can always be better than today. And we can make it so by acting the way generations of Americans past have. People didn't cross frontiers, pioneer and settle new lands without believing it was possible. We didn't send a man to the moon and bring him back safely without believing it was possible. We have always been about showing the world and showing ourselves that we represented the best of human potential. Well, that's what we're going to do again. I believe with all my heart America's best days are still ahead of us. That the young people who are here today can have a future that is worthy of their birthright as Americans.
And here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a president again who gets up every day and starts to work for you. Someone who knows that we don't just make change by talking about it or wishing for it. We make it by working hard for it and setting goals and getting there day after day after day with no discouragement and no despair. But the president has to understand what's happening in America, what the lives of Americans are like today. You know, tonight across Kentucky and America, you've got teachers who are sitting up grading papers and nurses are caring for patients. They need a president who listens to them. You know, we have... janitors who are cleaning up and waitresses who are pouring coffee. We have police officers who are standing guard. They need a president who stands with them again. And then we've got families who are sitting down looking at the bills, maybe talking about losing a job or even losing their home. They need a president who will deliver results for them. They need a president who knows that because of the failed economic policies of the last seven years, the American middle class is going backwards. You know, during the 1990s, the typical American family saw an increase of $7,000 in income. Contrast that to what's going on now, where the typical family has seen a drop of $1,000 in income. People are working harder and harder and harder. Lots of folks are taking more than one job, aren't they? Everybody in the family is going to work. And still, the price of everything goes up from health care to gas to energy to college tuition. And then let us not forget our brave men and women in uniform who are serving right now around the world. Maybe they're on patrol in Baghdad or standing watch in Afghanistan. Some may be on their second or their third or their fourth tour of duty. They need a commander in chief who respects their service, honors it, provides for their families and who knows that force should always be a last resort, not a first resort in solving the problems and challenges that we face in the world. I have run a campaign in which I'm very specific. I tell you what I want to do on the economy and health care, on stopping home foreclosures, on ending No Child Left Behind and making it possible for teachers to teach and students to learn again. Because I think we've got to rebuild the trust between our president and the people. And the way to do that is not just with words, but with actions. Not just with promises, but with results. And the way you get to that is by making it clear what you will do as president, because then the people can hold the president accountable. Now remember when President Bush ran back in 2000? I remember it well. He went all over this country telling people he was going to be a compassionate conservative, whatever that meant. <laughs> Turned out he was neither. And we paid a big price for it. I'm not asking you to take a leap of faith on me. I'm asking you to make this journey with me, to look at what I've done, the record of accomplishment that I bring, the experience and the qualifications, the determination and the strength to make these changes that our country desperately requires. We're gonna start getting this economy to work for average Americans again. Now, it wasn't so long ago that it did. I mean, I can remember 10 years ago. 
We saw the creation of 22.7 million new jobs. More people lifted out of poverty than at any time in our country's recent history. There was a feeling that we were all going up together. That's when America works best. Not when the rich get richer and everybody else stays flat or falls back. And there was a sense of possibility and promise in the air. Now, during this campaign, some people have criticized the 1990s. Well, that's fair game. Criticism is part of politics. But I ask myself, which part of it didn't they like? Was it the peace or the prosperity? I can't tell which. Well, here's what I'm gonna do. Number one, we're gonna scrub that tax code and we're taking out every single penny of tax benefits for any company that takes a job from Kentucky to a foreign country. That is going to end when I am president. And then we're going to look hard at the special tax breaks you know, why should a Wall Street money manager making $50 million a year pay a lower percentage of his income in taxes than a teacher or a nurse or a truck driver in Western Kentucky making $50,000 a year? And we're gonna look at all of those trade agreements. I believe in trade, but I believe in a level playing field. And I, for one, believe we got to have strong labor and environmental standards so that the rest of the world comes up to where America is, not that America is brought down to where the rest of the world is. And I will be standing up to China. I'll be telling China, you cannot manipulate your currency. You cannot steal our intellectual property. You cannot send us lead-based toys, contaminated pet foods, and polluted pharmaceuticals. We're not gonna take it anymore. And we're going to begin creating new good jobs, because that's what America does best. Every generation, we generate these new jobs, and it's time for us to do it again. And I am convinced that we can launch a clean energy revolution. We can end our dependence on foreign oil. I mean, isn't it outrageous that we are now more dependent on foreign oil than we were on 9-11? Doesn't the administration remember who flew those planes into those buildings? The hijackers were from Saudi Arabia. Well, when I am president, we will no longer hold hands with the Saudis. We will hold them accountable, and we will start acting in America's interests again. I believe that if we do this, it'll be the equivalent of the space race. We can excite the imaginations of our young people the same way many of us remember being excited by that space race. I didn't have a clue about how we were going to get a man to the moon and bring him back, but I never doubted we would because that's what Americans do, right? We set those goals and then we work till we achieve them in our business lives, our personal lives, and athletics, and every aspect of American life. So let's start thinking the same way about energy. I want to see young people in Western Kentucky figuring out how we're gonna get more gas mileage from cars. I saw a car the other day. It's one of those electric hybrids. It was driven 1,500 miles on 10 gallons of gas. We ought to start unleashing the creativity of every person in our country. And I am convinced that we can create more than five million clean energy jobs in the next 10 years. And those are jobs that can't be outsourced 
Because if we're putting solar panels on roofs and we're installing wind turbines and we're digging for geothermal and we're producing biofuels, we're going to be energy independent and the rest of the world will not be able to take advantage of us as they currently are. And we can bring down those gas prices at the pump. When George Bush became president, oil was $20 a barrel. Now we are over the barrel, aren't we? Yeah. So we can't just sit idly by and watch our country going deeper and deeper in debt to buy oil. We got to act now. And we've got to do the same when it comes to the generation of electricity. And it is so important that clean coal be part of that energy future and that we lead the world in that transformation. We get 52% of our electricity in America from coal. We're sitting on a huge natural resource right now. I will invest in the technology to capture and store carbon dioxide at coal-fired power plants. I want to keep coal as a major part of our energy creation, but it's got to be cleaned up and we need to be in the forefront. If we took the same attitude toward clean coal technology, sequestration and storage, we could begin to export technology around the world because other countries are going to need to clean up their act. When I am president, we're not going to enter into any global warming agreement unless China and India and those other countries are part of it because they too have to be part of the solution. And like many of you, I know how important it is that we enforce mine safety regulations, that we have a federal government that is on the side of the miners who risk their lives and their futures and their family's security. We've got to protect them because they're working hard to give us the supply of energy that we need. And after seven years of rewarding wealth, not work, we need to focus on manufacturing again. I don't believe you can be a great country for long if you don't make anything. And we have watched the steady erosion of our manufacturing base. We need to invest in all of the changes in production and technology that will enable us to compete. And people will have those good jobs. And we're going to end those giveaways to the special interests. I want to take that $55 billion back that goes to the oil companies and the drug companies and the pharmaceutical companies. That should be in your pocket. And yes, we will renegotiate NAFTA. NAFTA needs to have labor and environmental standards. And when I tell the people of Kentucky that I will fix NAFTA, I mean it. I'm not going to tell you one thing and tell a foreign government something else. I'm going to stay focused until we get the job done. And we are going to rebuild America. You know, we got bridges collapsing and levees collapsing. We've got water systems that are no longer up to the task. Previous generations of Americans made those investments. It's time that we did, and I believe that we could do it through a bonding program. Some of us can think back and, and remember, or read about it in the history books, that during World War II, Americans bought bonds, war bonds, and that money was used to retool our war factories. We had to quickly catch up with our enemies, and so those factories were going 24 hours a day. I believe Americans will buy bonds to rebuild America because you can see the results with the new roads and with the bridges and the end of congestion and mass transit and so much else. And I will end George Bush's war on science, a war that has undermined our investments in health and other scientific research. We have scientists in the labs who are 
on the brink of breakthrough discoveries for Alzheimer's or diabetes or cancer or heart disease. And they're being told to shut their labs because there's no more money. Well, I think investing in cures for diseases and how to prevent diseases will save us money over the long run. And so I want to start investing to make sure America remains the leader when it comes to discoveries that will make us healthier. And then once we have those discoveries, I want to make sure that everybody has access to quality, affordable health care because I want everybody to have a chance to be healthy, to stay healthy, to be cured, to prevent disease. After seven years of handouts to the big drug and insurance companies, we're going to put patients and families first. And yes, we will figure out a way to cover the 47 million uninsured, including more than 600,000 right here in Kentucky. I know there are a lot of stories that I could tell you going back many years because universal health care is a passion of mine. It's the cause of my lifetime. But I'll just mention one. You know, I was in southern Ohio campaigning a few weeks ago. I loved the way the Ohio primary turned out. That was a real good night. <laughs> and I was down along the Ohio River, and I was in a mobile home talking to some folks, and there was a man there who was a deputy sheriff. And he told me this story. The young woman who was in that small town, and she went to work at the local pizza parlor. She made minimum wage. She did not have health insurance. She got pregnant. She started having problems, so she went to the nearest local hospital because the county she lived in didn't have a hospital anymore. And when she got there, the hospital, and I don't blame the hospital, said, we can't do any more free care, so we can't examine you unless you have $100. Well, she didn't have $100, so she went back home. She kept having trouble, so she went back to the hospital. They told her the same thing. The next time she went back, she was in the ambulance. She went into the emergency room. The doctors and the nurses worked hard, but that baby died. And then the young woman was so medically distressed, they had to airlift her to the next biggest hospital, the medical center in Columbus. And for 15 days in the intensive care unit, doctors and nurses worked so hard. But she died. And I was sitting there while that deputy sheriff was telling me that story. And I was thinking to myself, you know, that's not, that's not the America we love. Our country is good. It's great. It's rich. It's not right. In fact, I'd say it's not moral for that young woman and her baby to have died because she didn't have $100 and she didn't have health insurance. <laughs> but it also doesn't make any economic sense. You know, by the time those two hospitals and all those doctors and nurses finished trying to save their lives, hundreds of thousands of dollars were spent. See, that's what happens too often in America. Somebody without health insurance will eventually get taken care of, but it's often too late, and the cost is so great. So when she didn't have the insurance and then the money was spent, everybody else ends up paying for it. The taxpayers pay for it, people with insurance it gets tacked onto our bills. We end up also paying for it. It just seems like it would be a lot smarter economically if we actually paid at the beginning a little bit in order to avoid paying a lot when it's too late and nothing good can be done. So when I'm president, we're going to open up the plan that ensures Congress and federal employees, it's a good plan. If you have insurance and you're happy with it, nothing will change. But if you're uninsured or you got insurance, except the insurance company won't pay your doctor or the hospital, that happens, then you're gonna have the opportunity to have the same health insurance as members of Congress do. 
And if you can't afford it, we're going to provide you with health tax credits and other assistance so everybody will be insured. And then we can emphasize prevention. And yes, we can also take care of mental health and dental health. Because if we have a healthier population, we will save money and improve quality. And we won't let the insurance companies be the deciders as to who lives or dies any longer in America. And we are going to make sure that education remains the passport to opportunity in America. And that means we're going to start with early childhood education, head start, pre-kindergarten, so kids are better prepared when they show up. And I will end the unfunded mandate of no child left behind. It's not working and it needs to go. I see there's a few people who agree with me on that. And that's because you know you may be teachers or principals or superintendents or school board members or concerned parents. And look what has happened. The federal government has mandated that all of our schools, like this one, go up to certain standards without giving you the money to do it. And that has meant that in places across America, property taxes have been raised. It's also meant that curriculum has been narrowed. A lot of decisions have been made to cut out things because they didn't fit the test. I do not think it is the best education policy to turn our young people into test takers and our teachers into test givers. That is not a good education. And we're going to make college affordable again so that hard-working, middle-class families can send their kids to college. I bet there are some of you who are already struggling with student loans, aren't there? How, how many of you have student loans right now? I'll tell you what. I'm always curious. Is anybody paying more than 20%? Yeah? Yes. You know what? In Indiana yesterday, from Muncie to Indianapolis to New Albany, I heard 25%, 27%, 29%. Now think about this. Because we've had historically low interest rates, but these student loan companies are predatory lenders, and they have been ripping off the students and the families of America. So here's what I'm going to do. We're going to double the HOPE tax credit so more families can use their own money more efficiently. We're going to expand programs like the Pell Grant so it covers more young people and you get more direct aid. I want to ask the colleges if they would enter into a contract so that when you start as a freshman, they can't raise the rates on you until you graduate. We're going to provide national service opportunities so young people can earn up to $10,000 a year for two years of national service that'll go right into paying for college. And I want to set it up so that you borrow directly from the federal government, bypassing these student loan companies the way we used to, and it was a lot cheaper. We had lower interest rates. You know, when I went to law school, I borrowed money at 2% interest. So I could afford that, and I paid it back over a couple of years. I didn't feel like I was an indentured servant, the way a lot of young people do. And if you do have student loan debt, here's my offer. If you're willing to do public service, like law enforcement, or the military, or teaching, or nursing, we will forgive your debt over time. So you see, I think there's a lot we can do that will make the American dream within reach again. People will start feeling like they're not just running in place, but they're getting ahead. And we'll be able to look at our children and our grandchildren and, and believe that their futures are bright. And of course, the next president is going to have to restore our leadership 
around the world. And that starts with bringing our troops home from Iraq as quickly and responsibly as possible. And when our troops come home, we have a solemn obligation to give them the care and the benefits that they've earned. So we're going to pass a 21st century GI Bill of Rights to help veterans go to college, buy a home, and start their own small businesses. Because when young men and women sign up to serve America, we sign up to serve them. And I am not going to stand by while the VA is underfunded, while people have to wait for months to get an appointment, why they can't get their disability compensation claims resolved, where they don't have jobs, where they feel like they are being forgotten and ignored and neglected. That is not the way America treats our heroes, and we won't be doing that if I am your president. Now, we're going to have a tough election in the fall because Senator McCain is a good man with a great history of service to our country. And we're going to have to have a nominee that is ready to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Senator McCain on national security. And I am so privileged to have been endorsed by more than 30 generals and admirals, including two former chairmen of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and one vice chairman, as well as General Wesley Clark, because they believe that I am ready to be that commander-in-chief and to make the decisions that will protect our country and protect our troops. No one will doubt that I am ready to answer that 3 a.m. call if something goes wrong in the world and the president must be called and involved. But let's not forget that sometimes when the phone rings at 3 a.m., it's not a national security crisis, it's an economic crisis. And we need a president who is ready, willing, and able to answer that call, who on day one can be commander-in-chief of our economy as well. I've been calling for action to stop these home foreclosures for a year, and our president hasn't answered the phone. And I think it's time that we have a president who will. That's a difference between Senator McCain and myself. He has admitted he doesn't understand the economy. And if you read his economic plan or listen to his speeches, it does virtually nothing to ease the credit crunch or the housing crisis. It's as if the 3 a.m. call came to the White House and it was on the economy and he just let it ring. Well, we need a president who's going to pick it up on the first ring and say, let's act so we get out of this problem and we start making it clear that we're going to have a strong economy, respect it again and make sure that the middle class is taken care of. I believe we can do this. I have no doubt in my mind. I have been there. I have watched for eight years. I've been part of this administration. I know this is the toughest job in the world, and we're not gonna have any margin for delay or indecision. We're going to have to be ready as a country. We will be tested, and there isn't a challenge we face that we can't meet if we are ready. But that's what your decision comes down to. Kentucky gets to help pick the next president. And I am so glad you do, because it's about time. Your voices were heard and your votes were counted in the presidential primary. Now, taking back that White House won't be easy, you know. Republicans are not going to give it up without a fight. Your senior senator is not going to give it up without a fight. It would be real good if we got more Democratic senators in order to help the Democratic president get all of this work done. It'll be a tough campaign, and there'll be hurdles and setbacks along the way. But I know what it's like to stumble. I know what it means to get knocked down. But I've never stayed down, and America's not going to stay down. We're going back together. We're going to stand up. But I need your help. I need your help in this primary. 
I need you to be part of this campaign because when I tell you I'll stand with you, that's exactly what I mean. And when I tell you I'll fight for you, you can count on it. That's what I've done my whole life. Now, you know, some people might say, well, we want something different. If we've ever needed a fighter, a doer, and a champion, it is right now. If we've ever needed somebody who was ready to go to bat for America, it is now. You know, many years ago when I started my legal career, I wasn't interested in going to work for a law firm. I wanted to work on behalf of kids. So I went to work for the Children's Defense Fund, fighting for abused and neglected children and children with disabilities, fighting for the kids who drew the short straws in life. And we all know who they are. And I was proud to do that. And I still do it today. You know, this morning in Indianapolis, I finished my speech and I went out and began to shake hands, like I will in a minute here. And I always try to make sure that I talk to all of the children. There was a little boy standing there. And when I reached out to shake his hand, he stood up and leaned into me and I leaned over to him and he said, my mama works for minimum wage and they keep cutting her hours so she keeps bringing home less money and we don't know what we're going to do. And then he started crying and I asked him, how old are you? He told me he was 11 and I said, it's been hard for you, hasn't it? And he just shook his head and kept crying and his mother was behind him and she was trying to shush him and, you know, trying to make sure that he didn't cause a fuss. I said, you know, I really am proud of you standing up for your mother like this. You know, telling somebody like me that your mama gets up every day and goes to work. And she is really having a hard time. But I walked away and I thought, you know, that little 11 year old boy, he needs somebody standing there with him. He needs somebody who understands what it's like to have a single mom trying to support him and herself and feeling like the walls are closing in and life is getting too hard. I know that we can once again make sure that people of our country feel that hope have that sense of possibility that children can worry more about going outside to play than whether or not they're going to have a roof over their heads and enough to eat or get to see a doctor. You know, it's the ideal that is inscribed on the base of the Statue of Liberty, the words that give voice to America's mission. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. You know, Lady Liberty has overlooked the harbor of New York through wars and the Great Depression and through the dark day of September 11th. It's a constant reminder of our resilience, our strength. So tonight, we say with one voice, give us the child who wants to learn. Give us the people in need of work. Give us the veteran who needs our care. Give us the mother and father who deserve a better chance in life. We say give us this economy to rebuild and this war to end. Give us this nation to lift, this world to lead, and this moment to seize. I know we are ready. And with your help, I would be honored to lead this government and this country into that new and better future. Thank you all, and God bless you, and God bless America.